Um, and really, it's very difficult for recipients of information, or stewards of information, as, uh, as I'll refer to them, really know what their role is in protecting that data. I think over time, um, information centricity is, is as much about being able to describe data autonomously, being, being able to have systems that know what data is when they're acting on it, as it is to be able to, you know, to, to teach people. Pretty, pretty important to most enterprises today. I mean, one of the speakers was saying that pretty much, you know, all all significantly important information in organizations is digitized today. People handle it all the time, and you know, having Vericept has about 800 customers, um, roughly 50 of the Fortune 500, and pretty much one out of every two Fortune 500 companies that's done something in DLP. Um, you know, it's not unusual for us to see organizations that you know, create a terabyte of data a day. Um, they don't know what all that is. They don't know where it goes. They don't know how it gets there. So what I'll talk about today, hopefully, and, and hopefully what you learn from our discussion today is, is really get your arms around what this whole thing about information centricity is, uh, what the cornerstones, which is uh, content awareness, um, what really underpins the notion of content awareness, how do systems use that functionality, and then what kinds of examples um, will illustrate and show you some examples that will certainly illustrate um, how you might use that to, to become more data aware in your security programs. And through who Veritech is. So there's uh, five bullets on the screen. E-discovery, data governance, info security, storage optimization, brand protection. All things that probably, um, as IT security professionals, you have come into contact with. E-discovery, um, you know, the, the, the somebody from Google shows up at your doorstep and says, I need to find everything that looks like this, and I need it now. And, uh, and, in, and when you find it for me, you need to make sure that no one can access it anymore. And uh, I need to know where it all is, and you can't miss any of it. Um, data governance, risk, and compliance. Oh, sorry. Apologize for that. Equipment failure already. Thanks. Um, I probably stepped on it. Um, information security. Um, well, we all, you know, I think lots of people read the Wall Street Journal. I certainly do. Uh, we see companies losing data all the time that's meaningful, impactful to their brand, their reputation. Um, the ability to be compliant. Mike Rothman had a nice talk today on compliance. Compliance in and of itself is probably something we shouldn't focus on. It's an afterthought of, of doing good security. Uh, but sometimes we can't help but, but deal with it, and especially with, with things like how much it costs, for instance. To be compliant is very expensive. It means you have to know where, especially around compliance initiatives like PCI, where all that information is so that you don't have to deal with making every server in your environment compliant. Are you sure that none of that data is on your PCs? It's really talking about, you know, there are many drivers today that are, that are driving people toward a deeper understanding of what their data is and where it is so that they can make better decisions about how to secure it, but certainly how to manage it. What are some common applications? Well, uh, certainly around some of the compliance initiatives, it's, hey, do I know when sensitive data is leaving my organization? Well, intrinsically, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not always understood by the senders what exactly it is they're sending. Um, and lots of times, business processes emerge, sort of maybe ad hoc business processes, that enable users to send information in a manner inconsistent with the way we should secure it, only because they're trying to do their jobs better. We find, for instance, in call centers, when, uh, when our customers have call centers where they're leaking a lot of credit card data, a lot of the modality about how that data gets lost is the following. They're having a conversation with a customer. They say, please mail me some account information. The customer mails them their credit card number. When that information comes in, you know, the credit card number is buried in the bottom because they think, well, you may need this to do something with my account. That call service representative emails that to 10 other people to have them help with that account. Well, there you go. A whole bunch of information gets lost. Someone downstream CCs you know, the, the customer on that, out goes a piece, of, you know, a piece of credit card data, never really entered into any of the formal credit card number repositories, but nonetheless, it left the building. How do you make processes aware to that? Uh, it, it's about content centricity. It's about being able to have security functions, communication paths that innately understand what information is moving on a transaction by transaction basis, so you can start to cover some of these use cases. And certainly, PII, intellectual property, customer data, all of these things um, are, are areas where there's highly sensitive information that can be transacted easily by stewards of that information who have free access, full disk encryption. A lot of our customers say, well, isn't that data really protected? I have full disk encryption on that. Well, 
to be able to do your job, even if your computer is full disk encrypted, that person needs to be able to access that data. By virtue of him being able to access it, he probably needs to email it sometimes. And he probably has full access to do whatever he wants with it. Um, he can lose that data as easily as anyone else can. He may send it home to an account. It gets on a laptop. His kid puts you know, um, some, some file sharing program on there, and voila, you've got a piece of data that's out in the clear. Now, those kinds of accumulations, I could name probably 10 other examples that cause that exact phenomenon to happen. And before you know it, you've got a lot of data sitting someplace that's in harm's way. So really being able to understand those kinds of what I'd call unwarranted transactions as they happen, and the ability to limit the scope of where data moves is, is about content centricity. And we'll talk about how you can do that in very practical ways. And then hopefully I'll give you some insight into what the technologies do and how they do it. Enterprises today have a lot of challenges in being able to do some of the, the actions I described. Uh, well, first of all, data is everywhere. I mean, if you took an inventory of where all your sensitive data is and you could do it effectively, you'd find that it, it morphs, it changes, it has a life cycle, and across its life cycle, it has countless opportunities to become a piece of some other data. So sensitive data merges with not sensitive data, which makes that sensitive data, and over time, you end up with a lot of sensitive stuff everywhere. It's generally opaque. If you were to talk to someone who has a, you know, in, in one of your areas that works with maybe high value intellectual property, they certainly could point you to a number of relevant documents that were on their laptop that they thought was important. Probably because they're using it actively. And they could say, hey, this program is the one I'm working on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm creating the greatest new formulas for widget XYZ, or I'm describing the best new marketing plan for a new you know, insurance program. And they can say, hey, I know where that is, and it's pretty sensitive, and, I, and I'm pretty careful with what I do with it, maybe. But they can't really remember all the sensitive stuff they built last year, the year before, what file share it's on. And, and they certainly didn't convey any information to the person who backs up that file share that that was really sensitive stuff, and that they should treat it a little bit differently and maybe encrypt it. So this whole morphology of data, and certainly the, the evolution of how it moves, you know, can start from a simple premise of, I just needed to put it somewhere, that I could, you know, that, that was bigger than the place I had it, or that was organized in a different way. But that information is opaque. The, the value of that is generally opaque to other administrators of that data, which makes it very difficult to track and maintain over time. Um, owners and requirements change. There's life cycles to data, as we all know. Um, securing information through those transitions of life cycle and ownership is a difficult challenge. What if I CC, you know, 10 people in my organization with something I'm working on? Maybe some of them for different reasons. Maybe it's just informational. I want someone to take a look at this. Does the person who receives my data really know how valuable it was to me before I sent it to them? Probably not likely. Data stewardship is not something that you can transact. Data stewardship is based in responsibility, and usually only the owners or the creators of that information have a good assessment of what the stewardship requirements are for that piece of information. Now compound that with data ages, it moves, it has to go into different lifetimes, meaning it goes from the creation phase to the usage phase to the retirement phase to the archiving phase. There's lots of phases in between there. But does the administrator, you know, three phases from, from the creator really understand how valuable that was? Does it even, can he even recognize it? I, arguably, we find all the time that, you know, when we, when we go into organizations and we help first start classifying the information, people don't even know the value or the types of information they have in their own, in their own perimeters of responsibility. So how can you expect an IT administrator or an IT security professional to know what to do with that? Compound that with, there are lots of different reasons to secure or manage data. Some of them conflict. Some of them um, act in harmony. Lots of different policies, lots of different systems. So how can you deal with this in a way that is consistent throughout you know, these processes and, the, and these requirements? And then, of course, business systems are very complex. And again, it, it's, in the end, they are most business systems are built to enable the free use of important data because that's how your business operates. And again, all of the value or you know, a lot of the value in, in that information is your ability to use it, act with it, create business value from it. So being, making it too restrictive um, to, to operate with that data is certainly something that's not going to be a very you know, uh, amenable in the business process if you can't do it in a way that is self-described or very easy to, to use. So, so what are the high-level requirements for being able to, to, to get our arms around all those spheres of, of, uh, of responsibility that, that come with 
securing data appropriately based on you know its business value and, and usage and compliance and all these different areas that uh, that that cause us to have requirements toward to data security. Well, well, one way is is if we can find a way to integrate data centric security components with the data app with data applications and IT infrastructure layers. Now, what does that mean? Um, well, maybe it means you know when an application is enabled to store something onto a, onto a system, can we ensure that through the business processes that use those applications, information is not going to the wrong places? And, and what is the information that's moving? It's as simple as, for instance, say you have a terminal application where you know, a call service representative is able to enter in a bunch of data. And we've seen this exact example, so it's, uh, it's not, it's not uh, science fiction. Um, maybe there's not strong type checking on the field entry on those data sets. And and maybe they're able to put a social security number in an address field or put someone's PII in, a, in, in some other ancillary column. Seems quite benign, except that maybe half of that database is being sold off to information for, for, for advertising, and the other half is, is really sensitive PII. And lo and behold, you're moving you know, a whole bunch of data that contains maybe social security numbers, people's information out, just because of a clerical error. So wouldn't it be interesting if you could have a way to be able to examine periodically or even at the time of the transaction what exactly that data meant that was going into those fields, maybe in an autonomous fashion, or, hey, who's accessing that data and what is it, and be able to restrict where it goes and how it gets there so that we can make sure that the right data is going to the right place. It, it requires knowledge that that data that's moving into that wrong field is actually something valuable. So we need to be able to, to integrate that kind of intelligence with, with our business systems, and I could go on and on. You certainly need to ease end user and enterprise interaction with security controls. And I said, you know, today, if, if all of a sudden we put a security technology in place that was highly data aware, but every single transaction that, you know, that, that was transacted with sensitive data had a pop-up window that made you justify why you were using that sensitive data, that wouldn't be a very effective business solution. And I think your, you know, people on the IT side of the house would certainly take, take offense to that. But what if, um, what if we coupled with programs to make people aware of what, data, what sensitive data is, allowed them to actually become part of the solution by, by, by being part of a workflow system that allowed them to actually instigate scans of, of their information perimeter to see, so, so they could take an inventory of what their sensitive data in and perhaps move them through a process of, of being able to act on that periodically so that they, they could at least understand what data was in harm's way and act on it appropriately. And we're seeing a, a lot of trends with this in, 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 our, in, our, in, our, in our marketplace where what we call self-service information-centric security is becoming a, a low total cost of ownership solution that invites users to learn about the sensitive data they have and trains them through showing them what they have in, the, in their possession and, and in giving them options. For instance, um, I just emailed something out, out of the building. Uh, it was detected that it had 100 customer account records in it. I didn't encrypt it before I sent it. Instead of Instead of having an IT administrator have to deal with that in the, you know, a, a, from a centralized administrative function, how about telling that user through an email that they did the wrong thing, it violates a policy, here's the policy, and by the way, click a button and encrypt it. It does a bunch of things. One is, it invites them to become more aware of the sensitive information that they transact. It lets them know that you care and that you know what's going on and that, and that there are mechanisms that help them do their job better. It also, in a sense, reiterates maybe training that you've given them about what's sensitive and what's not and what's acceptable to do with that. We, we find very often that that same person um, who's going to email you know, a bunch of information in the clear through a channel that's not warranted also might have you know, 10,000 sticky notes around their monitor that have customer account records all over them, right? Their, perimeter of, their security perimeter is, is sort of not really even cognizant that in the security perimeter, they're not cognizant that, that they're dealing with something that's, that's important. So this helps you know, limit the, you know, the overall risk surface here by making a, in a very easy way for users to be able to interact with sensitive data. Actualized data and security and separability. What does that mean? Well, in the end, uh, a lot of the mechanisms I've described really require that information uh, can be intrinsically understood as it transacts through your, your environment. That means that the security systems or the data protection mechanisms need to know what it is in the instance of the transaction. It means when I send an atomic piece of information in a channel from me to someone else over a certain, with, with certain applications that, that I can at least recognize what that information is when it's being transacted and apply a policy specific to what that is in that context. Now that's, in, in the end, 
what you need to be able to do is make sure that data can be automatically described. It doesn't require, at least to some extent, a user to have to tell you what that data is. We find that even in secure information lifecycle management systems, where you require people to classify data, that the, the largest single lapse in, 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 in that system's ability to function is that far too little of the sensitive information in your organization is actually classified appropriately. Really, only about 15% of most information is classified at all. And, and of that, a large majority of it might be wrong. So, so really, it, it can't be up to users to define what's sensitive, because very often they just don't know or they don't think to do it. So really, we want to be able to automatically describe data. Um, application of compulsory security needs to be autonomic. It means that when I find a piece of sensitive data, the right security happens. Now, there are degrees of, of this, right? And, and there's, you know, totally ludicrous where, you know, you try to do this across every piece of data. But within a hierarchy, we can all maybe define what's valuable uh, in, in maybe not a thousand buckets, but a few buckets. And be able to understand that, hey, you know, sending out 10,000 records of our customer data probably is something we want to keep an eye on, no matter what it's for. Even if it's just to recognize that we did it, if it's over the appropriate channels. Certainly sending it to a webmail account in a former Soviet bloc country might be something that should raise some awareness. Now that, that shows, you know, these kinds of things are possible today, but we really want to be able to create policies that apply that uh, autonomously. And, and it needs to be pervasive throughout the information lifecycle. So using these classifications, we need to make them sticky. We need to make them part of that data infrastructure so that when we transition from one lifetime, one, one part of a, a piece of information's lifetime to another, uh, we can really recognize the former or intrinsic value of that and make the right decisions. And it might simply be, you know, when you take that kind of data and you put it on tape for backup, just encrypt the tape. But knowing, you know, what kind of information is compulsory for encryption when it goes to tape is as important as maybe knowing which one shouldn't be, right? We could end up with all our tapes encrypted. We could end up with far too many tapes that say, you know, confidential. Really, that's noise in the system we need to get out, and, and data awareness is really where we need to go with that. Uh, data protection objectives, certainly, um, when you think about protecting data uniquely um, on a transaction by transaction basis, certainly we need to be able to answer some of the questions that are in the problem column here. There are a lot of technologies out there that, that are helping to, you know, organizations um, secure some of these. But, but in the end, at the top of the stack, it really is nearly impossible to secure a piece of data effectively if you don't know what it is. Um, lots of tools today work on, you know, encryption tools and whatnot work on, you know, that's a folder, I'll encrypt that. That's a folder, I won't encrypt that. The problem is what's in the folder and who put it there and why is it there and, and who can access it. The, these answers really only become answerable, if that's a term, when I know what it is. So we really need to get to the bottom of what it is so that we can apply other technologies that allow us to make sense of of what is the relevant security profile for that particular piece of information. Then we can start to restrict access, monitor who uses it, protect it with encryption, make it shareable, and, uh, and then control what applications can, can, can access it. So what are, we've talked about technology, we've talked about some of the objectives, and, uh, and, and part of this is, is getting you into some of the understanding of, of, of what exactly data centricity means from a, from a how do we describe data in, in, the, in the scope of our systems. Um, you know, a strategy is really to, to you know, from a, take this to an IT planning strategy, really we want to understand the risks that are associated with data that's not adequately protected. And, and that really, in, in some sense, comes down to being able to understand if sensitive data is in the right place in my organization. Is it, and, and, and this could be for many reasons. One is as simple as, I'm about to do a PCI compliance audit. I, I don't want to spend the money to, to do, in, you know, pen tests or other kinds of um, uh, analyses on all the servers. I'm not quite sure if there's sensitive data on all the servers. So let me just, let me find where it is so that I can make sure that I'm only scoping my, my compliance initiative to the right locations. Now, the, the everyone access problem creeps in to this, same, um, uh, to this same metaphor, which is if I don't know what data is on my file shares, and the access policy says everyone can access it, I, then I really, I'm, I'm quite sure that my data isn't safe. I'm quite sure that it's being used the wrong way. And, and being able to make sure that sensitive data is not in those environments is, is important in securing it properly. Um, where is it going? Who can access it? Being able to know where that goes across your organization. Business process engineering. Um, 
you, you know, it, it isn't very useful to understand um, conduits between um, organizations if you can't really tell what is traveling over those conduits. So we see um, all the time in our industry where you see a merger between, you know, two large companies, and the first thing that happens is to make their businesses sort of flow, they give everybody access to information on both sides, or they give a lot of people access to a lot of information on both sides. That um, causes a significant conundrum in being able to, in, in being able to uh, enforce the, the ownership boundaries of data. The other thing we see is that, that a lot of um, ad hoc, if not um, um, administered pipes go, go between the two organizations or go between an organization and its customers. And, and it happens out of good business reasons. I think um, this morning in Mike Rothman's talk, one of the things he, he talked about was the scenario where you come into the office at 9 o'clock in the morning and someone from, from IT tells you that, oh, by the way, we're rolling out a major new service and it's happening at 12.01, so if you really want to understand that, we should probably talk now. Um, and use an IT security person really is left holding the bag on being able to secure that. These sorts of things happen all the time. Maybe some you know about and some you don't know about, but certainly uh, there are ad hoc relationships. We see them uh, quite frequently where, you know, you find a new business partner, you're, uh, you know, a micro IT organization inside of, inside of a big company. We set up a business relationship. We start flowing information and none of it's secured properly. So we need to be able to monitor and see what's going on in these transactions so that you can have visibility to what's going on all the time. Um, controls. We need to be able to create controls and policies that take awareness of data into account so that we can administer the, the, the appropriate security at the time. And then over time, we need to be able to make sure that all this is working um, and, and audit the information appropriately about who's using what data so that over, over the long term, we can make strategic planning objectives to institute new, new training programs, new executive awareness programs, new business awareness programs, and business process analysis that lets us build over time more and more secure information um, handling systems. Well, to make sense of all this information, certainly it would be convenient if we could map this, the, the data that's in our organization in a, in a way that's certainly you know, meaningful to us as IT security practitioners, but in a way that doesn't become too onerous. Um, we've seen um, you know, effective use of a, of a three-tier a, a three -tier taxonomy, um, one that attempts to, to classify business information in, in, say, three broad categories. High business impact information, medium business impact information, and low business impact information. And under those three major headings, you may have a number of subordinate classifications. The term taxonomy tends to creep into discussions when you talk to people who do data classification. Um, I think maybe most of us are familiar with, with, the, with the term taxonomy. It's really just a, uh, you know, a tree and hierarchy of different types of data classifications, confidential documents, mergers and acquisition documents. Um, I know my friend Mark here is uh, very aware of, of taxonomy. Um, that, uh, that we can associate security policies to. In the end, uh, imagine that you have a SharePoint site. And your goal is to make sure that you know, all of the sensitive documents from project XYZ are in the right security domain. That, you know, I've set the right switches and knobs, and whatever goes there is under DRM control. What you really need to be able to do is make sure that, one, that the appropriate level of security measures are on that site to make sure that when indeed someone puts a piece of high business impact data in that, in that folder, that it's going to get encrypted properly. The other is, is what happens when someone puts some of that data into a low business impact folder? How can we recognize that? We need, to, we need to classify that data periodically to make sure that that, that, that phenomenon is not happening. And really, by, by, by segmenting you know, the, the information classes into something simple so that we can have general practices around handling this, makes it not so difficult for people to understand the value proposition of, of, of being able to, to categorize data like this. But, and, and also gives you, a, you know, broad policy sets that, that let you deal with this in, a, in, a, in an easy to administer way. Um, most people understand this kind of taxonomy. Uh, most people understand this kind of, did you have a question? I did. Okay. Um, this kind of taxonomy. And really the business of, of trying to be able to organize these things is really the work in this, in this practice, right? Go ahead. Okay. Conceptually, uh, 150% Sure. many organizations, if not most, are in a situation where they don't have formal uh, data handling and data classification 
policies. Procedures. Sure. Not policy. Procedures. Procedures. Policy yes. exists all over. Sure. Procedures are what's lacking. Sure. How does how do you effectively implement classification and handling into an organization that doesn't have the culture to do that? It's a difficult challenge. Um, we well, now I'll describe yeah, I'll describe so I'll describe what others have done better than you know sort of postulating what might be possible. I can talk about what other companies have done. Um, and we have clients and, and, and companies that we've worked closely with who have instituted an exact policy like this. First, they start out small. And you know, the difficulties getting even to small are, are often you know, big. Um, one is, is where do we start, right? And, and what's valuable? Certainly, getting the organization, the entire organization, to understand the value system around data is, is, is it can be a difficult one, especially if you loop in the legal people, right? Um, but, but in some organizations, you know, the, the, the you know, business forces drive them toward understanding that this is necessary. For instance, if you're a military contractor or you build, you know, um, uh, weapons or military vehicles, and you, you have contracts that constitute um, that you need to protect certain data in certain ways, you know, you're motivated to go do this. And, and we see a lot of people start, I mean, a lot of people who are very sophisticated at this have started because there are business problems that can't be solved without doing this, which is, you know, I don't get that contract or I don't keep that business or some, some force like that happens. It really comes down to, you know, starting, again, uh, the, the, the business side, getting the business owners to, to believe that this is valuable, right, uh, is an is a almost organizational, you know, specific to organizations for sure. Um, but in the cultures that it's worked in, you know, there's been, uh, we've seen sort of security pundits or people who are driving these kinds of programs, um, you know, do a good job of, of socializing, you know, the business outcomes that happen, the positive business outcomes that, that, are, that, that happen with this, which is, you know, in some cases, lower storage costs. Um, in, in their industries, there have been, you know, highly publicized breaches, and they can show correlation between understanding our data and protecting it, and that's certainly something that has drove, driven motivation in, in, in a number of organizations. Compliance mandates, um, you know, being able to reduce the total cost of a PCI audit because I know I'm, I have to audit less servers. These kinds of things, um, and depending upon your industry, may be more or less relevant. Now, taking that from, you know, it's a good idea, we should think about doing it, to how do we practice it, has always, we've seen as a, as a you know, pilot to practice phase. You, you know, th these organizations start in an area where they think there's high value in doing so. They build procedures. Um, they work collaboratively with business owners and with, with internal organizations to craft policies and procedures that make sense for what they're trying to accomplish at that time and, and institute them and see the results and then tend to, to move on. It's, it's never, in my experience at least, a, you know, drop the gavel and we shall um, across the organization. But, um, but you know, some, in some cases it's driven by necessity and a, and a, and a clear understanding that there's going to be increased, you know, you know lower costs or, or even lower risk in the long term. Uh, if you look, if, if you saw uh, Mike Rothman's discussion, it's very often, uh, you know, that pragmatic CSO who talks about business risk and really understands the stewardship responsibilities of the, uh, of the organization's data within the context of, of their business operation that is able to, you know, move some of these, these, these things forward. Hopefully that answered your question. I could get into more nuts and bolts about how you actually do it. Well, but yeah, I, I mean, that's where the interesting conversation There's is. more here that we'll talk about. I know my challenge is being in a, in a particular segment of the financial service industry that is not driven by PCI, is not driven right, sure. by compliance, and if culture doesn't exist, you know, you can, yeah. have, a, you can have a, you know, a CIO who advocates this. It's, you know, yeah, it's it, fighting culture. It can be a difficult why, challenge. Why, why make the business change from efficiency and effectiveness to transact the business to now trying to add something in to that process? Yeah, there, yeah, there, are, there are mechanisms today that are you know, used effectively that, that, that have very low business impact, if, if, if at all any business impact. It really comes down to what risks are you, are you, are you reducing and whether or not the organization appreciates that those those are, those are, you know, there's a value system in, 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 in adopting these policies. Certainly in, in, um, in other areas of financial services, and even in some, I'm not sure which one you're in, but, you know, we've seen lots and lots of financial services organizations, um, 
you know, maybe not do uh, you know, the, the, the be all end all, I know what every piece of data in my organization is, but certainly they want to protect their customer data because they know they can be a, an effective churn or brand equity damage due to I've lost a bunch of customer data. That sort of, that, you know, that's the tip of the spear that sort of expands the content awareness momentum in an organization. It's, it's if you've seen something really bad happen to someone in a peer group or you can, you can help you know, streamline or automate you know, your information security practices because you, can know, because you know what data is, that's where we've seen organizations bring it in. But um, you know, this, is a, this is still a, you know, quite new, I'd say, in general. You know, most of the places that we, we encounter are green fields, people just doing this for the first time. And, you know, there's a, I, think, I, think, I think it's sort of universally good, motherhood and apple pie, to say I should protect my data and I should know what it all is. <laughs> right? Turning that into a practice where you can actually you know, convey business value um, is, it can be a difficult challenge for certain organizations. Um, you, you, you sometimes get the question, well, we've never done it before, and it's never hurt us before. And then that's, um, you know, but you know, there are lots of drivers, and we'll get to more. Uh, and f yes, go ahead. I was just thinking, one, is the cost of mailing every one of your customers to tell them that you may not have, that you may have lost that person. No, Absolutely, and that's a uh, you know very tangible, especially under certain regulatory circumstances. California um, SB 1386, right? There's there are there are you know laws on the books in some states, and you know quite frankly, a lot of the compliance initiatives haven't had teeth. Most most of them haven't, right? There haven't been a lot of very onerous compliance regulations that actually you know come down and cause pain to users. But you know if you're in a retail sector and you lose a bunch of people's credit cards, you know there's definitely a direct correlation between that and incidental spending in your store. <laughs> People come in, pay cash, and buy exactly what they wanted before they walked in the door and don't buy anything else. Credit cards, you know, offer that power and it's a very, you know, that hits your bottom line quickly. So I think that more than even the PCI, you know, PCI telling you you shouldn't do that is, is, a, is, a, is a very, you know, driving factor in people wanting to make sure they're securing their information wisely. Um, hopefully I've addressed some of those questions. Um, so how would you do it? What would you do? Um, well, in, 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 in broad scope, the idea is that where data is created, over the conduits it's transacted, and where it rests, we're going to apply classification to be able to understand what that data is and how it's transacted. Now that can mean, that's a very broad statement. Um, in a DLP system, it could be something as simple as, when 10 credit cards leave the building, I encrypt it. Sort of a low business impact, maybe high value outcome, not onerous, I don't have to do it on every file share, I don't have to do it everywhere, but it's helping me not send customer data out unprotected, maybe to my partners or, or somewhere else. Um, it might be, you know, in the file share where I know that people are, 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 are inter interacting around a brand new widget we're building, can I make sure that the file, at least all the data that's important or seems important goes in that file and that file is encrypted? That's the baby steps. In the long term, it's the ability to, as information gets created, funnel it into the right information security realm and then be able to apply policies and those policies are sort of very sticky to that data. That data when it moves, um, the other systems around it know how to react. So, so if it's encrypted here, well, it might want to be encrypted when it goes here um, or when it moves here. When it's encrypted here, maybe I want to you know, encrypt it when it's on that desktop. Or maybe I want to make sure that DRM is associated with it and it only goes to people that I believe should be accessing that data. And in the end, it comes down to being able to know what that data is. If you, um, if you poke around the industries of data classification or, um, or DLP and you, you start to get some insight, you, you'll notice that, again, data classification infrastructure is at the heart of those systems. They, they are striving to understand every piece of information that passes by them, whether they're at rest or in, in motion or in use. And you'll see a lot of technologies. This is a representation of a, of a typical um, data classification stack that is meant to operate on structured and unstructured information. And typically, your motivations or goals in looking at those two different data types might be quite different. Um, for e-discovery, maybe you want to know, hey, here's an email and show me every document that's related to that email. That's one way you may want to look at, at a classified data. Another is you may want to say, hey, any, any piece of information that's in that database when it leaves the company, it only can leave over email. It needs to be encrypted, and any other means of transaction is, is not valid. So you want to treat different kinds of data differently, and, and they certainly have very different requirements for how you analyze them and, and, and how you act on them. 
uh, you, you move from the spectrum of data detection, which is, hey, here's a piece of information, find it every time it moves, to here's, here's an information type, tell me when you see something like it. It's sort of the same as if I put a stack of 1,000 papers in front of you and said, in there, there's legal documents, contracts, um, there's, there's uh, employee records. You put them in three piles, sort of information classification at a topical level, not at an exact data level. And you'll see a lot of, you know, capabilities around being able to do exact data excerpts from a database, being able to take document samples. So I have a 10-page a document. You know, tell me any time you see a meaningful excerpt of that 10-page document and show me where that is. Um, being able to use regular expressions. And something called um, classification, which is it's more sophisticated in that it really does understand information equivalence. So if I, if I had a document and 10 of us wrote you know, a derivative work from that information and, and we used similar features in that document, could I detect that those other 10 documents were actually somehow related in their information content to that source document? Then the ability to take all of that, um, lay it out in structures, categories, taxonomies, being able to then apply that to the business of putting data in buckets and then making policies and actions that connect to that. And it's all about how, you know, modern technologies approach seeing data. Now down below here, you know, that data has to get into these systems somehow and you'll find that, you know, vendors in this space or technologies that are prevalent have the ability to look at this stuff when it's on a file share or when it's on a repository or when it's in a database. They have a lot of access layers that let you funnel data toward this technology. You'll find that uh, when, when thinking about these things or if you, if you get involved in thinking about classifying data, you're going to say, well, how do I know when all this works? And how do I know what, what success is in being able to classify information? Things like false positives, false negatives, precision, recall, accuracy, relevance, these terms, which I'll appro approach clarification on for you, um, are going to be the phrases you have to deal with and in, in, in the, in the, in the concepts you have to understand when you go about trying to you know, make sense of your data. Um, you know, the, the term precision, I think if anyone has, has worked with IDSs, you know, the term false positives, false negatives, these things. In the, in the data classification world, it's not much different. Um, it, it is really, you know, what, you know, precision is technically, you know, the intersection of the relevant documents versus the retrieved documents over the retrieved documents. Of all the documents that I brought back from, from, from my search, which of those did I care about? Really, what's the percentage of stuff I cared about to stuff that I really didn't care about? Um, that's precision. And if it's a one, then you've, you've retrieved everything that's, you know, everything you retrieved is interesting to you in that search. Recall is, is, is slightly different. It is the, the ratio of all the documents I cared about that I retrieved to all the documents that were out there that I should have cared about. It's really, you know, if there's a, uh, a hundred codfish on the bottom of the, of, of, the, of the ocean and I throw my net down there, did I, how, many, how many of them did I bring back? This is the only species I really cared about, maybe, because um, I, I happen to like codfish. Now, the relevant things to think about when you look at performance of classification systems is, what job am I trying to accomplish? In e-discovery, for instance, it may be way more valuable to you to bring back everything than it is to bring back only things that are interesting. Meaning, ideally, you'd like to bring back everything that's interesting. But the problem is, is that the problem can't be scoped like that because it's difficult. Text classifiers have a generally difficult time being good at both precision and recall. So you really start to get into something called accuracy and relevance, which is, of the things I was interested in finding, you know, what certainty do I have that I got most of them? Um, even if that means that I have some things I didn't want. And in, in many cases with classification, especially if you, in, in the end, if you want to do a 100% perfect job of making it work for every document you have, um, in the end, um, you know, in, in some small fraction of the documents that, get, that you get involved with, humans are going to have to be involved. That could be as simple as, Hey, Joe, we scanned your laptop on Tuesday, and we found, you know, 100 documents that were interesting that, weren't, that we think weren't protected. You know, there's a probability that, you know, 92 of them are exactly what should be, and, and, and you probably should just automate the, 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 the disposition of those. But there are five documents you probably want to look at, and maybe you should think about what to do with those. It really comes down to, you know, 
modulating low false positives and low false negatives to affect the application that you're trying to accomplish. Is that one document in an e-discovery scenario? I want very high recall. Why? Because the one document that I didn't find that was out there, right, when I'm trying to be too precise, could be the one that makes a difference in the case that I'm trying to win. But that being said, in an active control scenario where I'm trying to block emails based on sensitive content leaving the building, a, you know, one-tenth of one percent false positives for a given content type could mean my business is shut down. So you really want to be able to have systems that enact combinations of classification that allow you to tailor the use of classification for the application that you're trying to, trying to achieve. Check time. Getting down, getting down there. So what all do these classification technologies allow you? One is something called exact content match is a very typical classification method. It's really the ability to excerpt something from a structured data repository and find it in an arbitrary context. So I take, you know, enough information about one row of a database to be a meaningful piece of PII and I find it in an email that someone sent and, I, and I'm 100% positive that I got it, that I know it exactly was that because I'm exactly matching it. Prevailing technologies in this area can, can effectively, in practice today, in, you know, functioning technology in the industry, literally fingerprint to this, to this extent, you know, 100 million record databases and then find them in any communication leaving, leaving the perimeter of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a network at line, at line speed. So pretty, pretty mature technology today and works very well. Full and partial document match. This is the ability of a classifier to take an unstructured document and fingerprint um, segments of it in a way that you can detect major chunks of it. We call this quotations in the text classifier world. Quotations from another document in something else. So meaningful sets meaning uh, prevailing technologies today let you do things like window. Um, I'll break this document up in 186 byte chunks and I'll look for those in other documents. It's the cut and paste um, you know, uh, detection. Now, something to know about those two technologies is that exact data matching methodologies like fingerprinting, like content matching, really only can find what you've shown them. They have no idea, for instance, if I, if I, if I handed you a document and I said, um, here's, our, here's our Form 10-K that we're going to be filing with our earning results or we're filing our earning results in three days. Um, you know, don't tell anyone about this. Well, you could easily read that document, put it aside, and write from, from your experience in reading that, you know, three simple, you know, sentences that explain everything that's in that document, at least everything that's important in that document, without ever really using, you know, having a meaningful excerpt from that document. What you did was you conveyed information, you didn't con convey data. And, and really, these technologies are only good if you want to detect the conveyance of data that was previously known to the classifier. Um, there's another type of classifier, and, and I remember that, that, uh, that, that um, stack of technologies. One was data classification way on, data uh, detection way on one side, the other was cl information classification. The topical classifiers are another realm of classification, and they are really um, textual classifiers that allow you to understand information equivalence or information by topic. Again, the example I gave you where you have a stack of documents, and I ask you to put them in piles. This technology is very good at finding everything, meaning it's, it's going to have high, higher false positive ratios than the other more precise techniques, but it's going to get you everything. It's, going to, it's very useful in knowing what's, uh, answering the question, what's out there? What kind of sensitive data do I have? Once you use this technology to know what you have, then you can apply more exact data matching technologies to be able to then prevent them from going certain places. And it's the yin, it's the yin yang of, 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 of various classifier techniques that allow you to build profiles so that you can apply it effectively in your environment. Again, com combining these kinds of classifiers give you the ability to, to modulate their effectiveness across the applications you want to prescribe to. So for instance, um, block all M&A documents, that could be a file matching implementation, mailed from someone outside the legal department um, and based on, on some rules. Find and protect all internal design documents. You really want to know where they all are first. You want a more broadly effective classify by topic. Maybe, you're, maybe you've put things in, in gross bins on a, on a file share and now once they're in there and you've had you know, the ability to interact with them and know that those are in the right class, then you may want to create rules based on another technology, be able to block them when they leave your building. 
And many DLP systems are organized on these kinds of technologies. Certainly a lot of classification systems use the tenets that I've, that I've described here. So summarizing, the, you know, the, the, we talked earlier about you know, how to approach or what's involved with or what your objectives might be um, in, in, in embarking on you know, a, a, a content-aware security infrastructure. Um, some of these things sound very complex. Um, I think in, in practice, uh, when deployed, you know, in, in the right, in the right um, um, under the right frameworks of, of procedures and certainly um, taking, uh, you know, the, the, the objectives, the proper objectives into consideration, uh, they're actually quite doable today um, and, and the technologies work. Um, to be effective, certainly there are, there are you know, again, four basic requirements that you want to be able to, to apply. One is, is policy. In any content-aware security solution, the ability to art articulate content and context specifics. So, so Joe mails this content to this place over this conduit is a, is a cornerstone of being able to express these policies and be able to make, uh, make, make control objectives happen. Um, being able to detect content in all forms. So, so when you define what's sensitive, you, you need to make damn sure that you're able to detect it in, in many circumstances. So when someone puts it into a webmail or when someone puts it into a into a, uh, uh, an email, but to a, to a bad destination. You want to be able to find it and, and protect it in, in all circumstances. Remediation is key. Enterprise workflow and remediation are key in, being, in making these solutions practical. So, so if you could imagine, uh, probably all of you or many of you have had experiences with IDSs and the, the scenario where I turn it on and I'm overwhelmed with what I find, meaning you know, the logs fill up and you've got to go in there and try to understand what, what really happened and that was important and you know, what really happened or what didn't happen that it said happened. And now you've got to you know, build a culture around reviewing all this stuff and, and making sense of it. Really, in, in, in modern content-aware systems, and, and you need to strive to make you know, workflow and remediation and, and use of these classifier technologies um, ease the problem of, of information overload. And that means you know, pushing decisions out to the people who own the information in some cases, making them part of the stewardship challenge, which is, you know, through training, through notifications, through integration with their, with their environments, making them be part of the solution so you don't have to have a team of administrators, you know, going through all of the violations that happen. And then, of course, being able to use high-level reporting and auditing so that you can know whether or not your, you know, your security uh, you know, whether the risk factors in your environment are, are, are getting better over time in a macroscopic way. Um, let's see. I have just a few examples. I'll go through them pretty quickly, and then uh, we can get to some questions. Um, so, so data in motion example, you know, the, really the ability to be able to monitor when confidential data is, is, is transacted, maybe being able to block that at the perimeter. Um, certainly content awareness is important. Um, an employee attempts to download a piece of content, you detect that it's actually a risk associated with sensitive financial data. You can control it at the edge and then audit on, um, on, on where it went and, and have it be part of an executive report. Uh, similar examples here for, um, for email, being able to do things like encrypt and remediate, um, you know, all around content. So these are all things that are possible, you know, conventionally possible to do. Uh, technologies today exist that can do that. Um, being able to look at stored data across your organization and, and bin it, make sense of it and then be able to move it to places where it's, where it's less secure, and then being able to also interact with data on endpoints so that when people take information home, they might not be able to take your sensitive data and share it on USB drives and, and others. And we see a lot of concern today with, with USB drives. That's it um, for, my, for my discussion. Any questions, comments? Um, you can, if, if anybody's interested in getting this content, um, you, can, you can email me or we'll probably put it up on our website or something. Yes? Um, in general, I see that um, you know, full text index search has some, some principles that make it cumbersome in, in DLP-like um, functionalities. And, and one is that you know, just being able, you know, in, in very often the, the search indexes are proportionally sized to, to the information that they're actually attempting to search. Um, I do see in, in the long term DLP and enterprise search sort of uh, I think DLP becomes something called data protection 
in its, in its evolution. And then enterprise search and other information-centric technologies become something called data governance, which is, is over time really the ability for you as security administrators and, and, and to some extent IT administrators to be able to know what and where the data is sort of ubiquitously and be able to search it and transact it um, more effectively. I think that the technologies that you see in, in these DLP kind of products are very complementary to classical enterprise search technologies. As a matter of fact, in our products we have full text index search features that augment our DLP capabilities. But I think um, in some cases they serve different objectives. For instance, um, these kinds of technologies I just described are extremely fast. And, and they're fast for data they've never seen before, meaning they can run at wire rate. Full text indexing generally has difficulties running at wire rate. We have deployments of our technology in places where there's multi-gigabit line rate on, on, the, on the network that we're acting on. So I think there are some technology challenges, um, but, but in general, they're moving toward a, a shared vision for data governance, which um, I think is a, is a, you know, a three to five year vision for, for some of this technology. Any other questions? You guys developed, make sure you fill out your evaluation forms. They're very helpful to us to figure out what the boxes you like and how to improve them and everything. So please do that. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. Awesome. Well, 